Well, thank you very much. Um, I do want to say it, it almost seems as if we coordinated uh, presentations, but I, I very much appreciate being part of this session. Um, I think, as you know probably better than I, that uh, there really has been a lot of interest in the public lately in, in, in newspapers, in dairy trade magazines, related especially to the exposures of children that are, are living near dairies. In particular, um, studies of, of these communities have shown that children living close to dairies and other livestock environments um, that have low levels of exposure seem to be more, less likely to develop asthma later in life. Uh, exposure to low concentrations of very diverse bioaerosols. Does this sound okay? Or is that? Is that better? It still echoes a little bit. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll keep forging ahead. So one of the more interesting ones was a study that came out of Sweden. And in particular, you know, what they did was they looked at children um, from a very early age on up to about three years and specifically showed that the immune system, B cells, were activated or primed in, in children with these exposures. It is interesting with this echo here. Um, one of the recommendations that came, maybe I'll try this. I don't know if this will help. A little bit. One of the recommendations that came from these researchers that it might be helpful for pregnant women to spend time on dairies. Is that a good idea? Bad idea. Um, you know, hysteria, just to throw that out there, as uh, Dr. Duncan just mentioned, may be one reason to think that this may not be the best idea. Other studies of large modern dairies have found that exposure to high levels of organic dust generated during milking, moving cows, and other tasks have been associated with inflammation and decreased lung function and related to asthma-like diseases, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So, it may appear that there is conflicting data coming from these community studies and occupational studies. So what's going on? How do dairy producers make sense of the science and respond appropriately? Or better yet, how do dairy producers help the science advance? In this presentation, we'll take a little bit closer look at recent examples of both community and occupational health studies related to dairy, explore their strengths and limitations, and consider the cumulative evidence and a couple of recommendations. To take a step back to begin with, Science itself is based on a system of observation, formulation, and testing of hypotheses. It's designed to explain relationships and to predict outcomes, and it's very dependent on replication and, and peer review. Producers cannot base decisions about practice on one study alone. But they must consider the body of evidence, the strengths and weakness of each study, of all the studies, the populations that were studied. And beyond the science, there are a host of practical implications. Are decisions reasonable, economic, socially acceptable, ethical? Jump way ahead. 
There is a strong body of evidence, more than 35 to 40 studies going back more than a decade, that do demonstrate being raised on traditional dairy farms is protective for allergy and particularly for asthma. These studies in Northern Europe, North America, South America, New Zealand, and Australia are fairly consistent in showing that the effect is strongest when exposure occurs in utero and that the positive effects do extend into adult life. Specific exposures with cows, high microbial diversity, and drinking raw milk seem to be key factors for asthma. The evidence isn't as consistent for allergy. There are cell studies, animal models, as well as the human studies that are helping to explain how this exposure to a complicated microbiome actually affects immune responses. But more studies from an epidemiological standpoint are really needed to understand the relationship between the levels of exposure, the timing of exposure, and the development or lack of development of disease. In the recent study, which was mentioned a little bit earlier, um, of communities near the Yakima Valley, Williams et al. looked again at exposures in homes at a number of distances away from farms. What they did was to measure settled dust in these homes. They found a concentration gradient with higher exposures, as was noted a little bit earlier, in homes that are closest to the dairies. And they did make the comment that these levels of exposures are in the range that has been associated with negative respiratory health effects. A couple of limitations of this study, one is that it was cross-sectional in nature. Uh, only one set of samples was collected at one point in time. Another potential limitation is that these were settled dust samples. And the relationship between that settled dust and inhalation exposure in particular is not necessarily a very straightforward issue. Just to take a real quick look, uh, as Dr. Uh, Alderman mentioned, uh, there's been significant significant amount of work that has focused on endotoxin and its exposure. There is uh, very strong evidence, again, from cell studies, animal studies, and human studies, showing that endotoxin does have a detrimental effect on respiratory disease. This is just a, a, a quick example to make the point that this is actually a fairly complicated relationship and one of the most important factors seems to be human genetics. In particular, uh, there have been a number of studies that have looked at something called toll receptor genes. These are uh, located on the cells of immune systems and are some of the first portals that come into contact with an antigen in this case, endosomes that comes into the body. So activation of these toll receptor pathways has been looked at in a number of populations. And one of the things we have seen with mutations is that they may either be protective or they may increase the rate of disease. So the effect seems to go in multiple directions. And in particular, this is just one of, of many immune system uh, pathways that are responsive to endotoxin and the many other agents that are part of these organic dusts. Again, with the study in Sweden with Lindahl, 
one of the things they did show was that children who did not have maturation or, or could say that in, in another way that children whose development of active B cells was inhibited or suppressed were the ones that were more likely to develop asthma later in life. So the conclusion is that exposure to these dairy gas is helpful in priming these B cells so that the immune system does recognize the antigen and again it seems to be protected for asthma. Recent studies on large modern dairies have found that respiratory disease well decreased compared I think to traditional farms still remains a bit of a problem. Exposure to high levels, as opposed to communities, we're seeing much higher levels in these occupational settings. Exposure to these high levels, again, has been associated with development of asthma-like diseases and other types of lung disease. In particular, our work and others that have looked at genetic makeup and asked about prior exposure have found that workers born and raised on farms, workers with prior experience, seem to be at a lower risk of developing these diseases. So to some extent, this seems to be consistent with the studies of children. Again, one of the things that we have seen in particular is that new workers coming into dairies usually adapt to these exposures and do not develop diseases. In addition to having been born, raised, worked on a dairy farm prior, there are a number of other factors that are helping to explain why some workers seem to be more susceptible. In particular, again, genetic mutations, but also co-exposures to things like pesticides and behaviors, such as smoking, pre-existing conditions like obesity may also play a role. So, so it's, it's not, not a, a real straightforward straight relationship. This, this is just a really short example, example from one of our recent studies, studies and it was, was looking at a population that included dairy workers, but it's, it's not, not exclusive to dairy workers. workers. And, and what it's showing in each panel, I can find the right point to push is a relationship between individuals that did not have a mutation in these toll receptors compared to individuals who did have that. We're looking at change in pulmonary function across the workday and the interaction aspect, here we're looking at pesticide exposures. And with this small sample size, we actually did see statistical significance showing inter that interaction. So essentially, this was providing evidence that it's not genes alone, it's not exposure to the bioaerosols alone, there's other factors that also play a role. So, Exposure to a diverse microbiome does play an important role in asthma. Whether it's protective or harmful appears dependent on the level and timing of exposure, co-risk factors, including human genetics. High levels of exposure to organic dust have been associated with increased lung inflammation and decreased lung function. And the growing body of evidence indicates that children living near these areas with exposure to low levels at a very young age actually are protected against asthma. 
And again, this is consistent with the observations we've made that new workers who don't have prior exposure seem to be the most susceptible. But from a big picture risk assessment standpoint, there are other important disease endpoints to look at. As Dr. Duncan uh, explained in his previous slides, infectious diseases are a concern. Listeria, E. coli, just to throw out a couple of examples, chemical exposures. Uh, there's actually a fairly long list of things to consider. Producers need to understand the risks given current evidence and balance with reasonable approaches that optimize the health of the workforce, their livestock, their consumers and neighbors. And this is just a short list of some of the other aspects that people need to think about. Um, Again, you know, with the huge pressures that are coming from consumers, and, and we're seeing the impact on that in terms of some of the uh, food providers around the country changing their practices, uh, communication, scientific literacy among the public, and commuting with these, communicating with these consumers seems to be a, a tremendously challenging issue. So, so we, we would like, like to suggest that it be helpful for, for producers to continue to engage with researchers, to address research gaps, to conduct relevant studies, and to use prudence where feasible through adopting best practices that again promote cow health, worker health, productivity, and community health. It is worth emphasizing that modern dairy production has already significantly reduced the prevalence of respiratory disease through improved engineering controls and changes in their operations. There are further steps that producers could take to reduce the risk of respiratory disease. Identify locations and tasks that contribute to respiratory exposures. Conduct baseline and annual medical exams to identify existing respiratory problems or developing problems among workers before they become worse. It's worth mentioning that it's not legal anymore to conduct pre-employment physical exams, but working with medical providers, workers' compensation characters, Carriers, you, there's a lot of characters out there too. Um, you may be able to manage workplace job placement. First, focus on engineering, engineering controls. Although there are very few studies that have looked at engineering and few that are designed to look at the impact on workers, there is evidence that increasing the frequency of, of washing dairy parlors, enclosed cabs, ventilation systems are effective. In particular, there has been some work looking at bedding material that has also shown efficacy in changing biodiversal exposures. When engineering controls don't work, it is possible to use personal protective equipment, in particular respirators, N95 respirators. There's a couple of caveats with those. First, to make sure that people are medically qualified to wear a respirator, that the respirators are appropriate for the exposures, including chemicals, and that workers are trained in their use. To be effective, any intervention needs to be practical and cost-effective. Again, we would like to encourage producers to continue to engage with researchers to understand the science and to address knowledge gaps that are most important for the industry.
Thank you. Thank you. And if, if there's, there's time, time, I'll take, take questions. questions. Apologize for this echo. It is really disconcerting. What, what, what one of the more recent, recent studies by Samadhi looked, looked at a variety of bedding materials. materials. Uh, uh, sand, sand in particular was shown, shown to, to reduce exposure to E. coli. And in, in comparison, he also, he also looked at bedding made out of compost material. And, and it seems logical that he had a much higher bioaerosol Um, I read some literature, some older literature, and I think it was from Europe, and it looked at um, the relationship between uh, lung cancer and dairy workers and endotoxin exposure. And, and it seems to suggest that uh, dairy men who are exposed to endotoxin have a lower incidence of uh, lung cancer. And I wasn't sure, I was wondering if you had looked at that literature and are familiar with it. And, um, as, as part, part of the review that, that Dr. Dr. Alvin mentioned, we did take a look, look at that. that. And, and uh, my, my opinion in looking, looking at that literature was that the, the, the weight of evidence, evidence was, was not all that strong. strong. So, so it, 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 it caught, caught our attention, attention but it's but something it's that hasn't shown, shown up in the literature, the literature very much. much. And, and again, again, I'm not sure how strong that evidence is. is. 